Thank you, Professor Dudesh, for the uh, introduction. And uh, thank you to the organizers for the uh, opportunity to speak uh, at this conference uh, today. And uh, I'm really glad to, to be able to participate in this, uh, this common, common project. Uh, and the topic of my presentation would be uh, of course, Serbian company law, <laughs> and I will, uh, I will speak a, a bit about uh, some challenges and unanswered questions. So, my, my presentation will be divided uh, basically in two parts. So, firstly, I would just give a very, very brief uh, overview of the historical developments in order to see from what we came to 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 to, to where are we now. And I would try to make I, I would try to make some uh, some conclusions about the comparative roots of Serbian company law. And at the beginning, I would say there are no conclusions. It's very difficult to to define it, but but. But you'll see that, and after that, I, I picked up several issues, which I think I are uh, relevant at the moment for for the for the Serbian company law. They are, of course, more general one because we don't have much much time today. But I, uh, I, I think I, I heard from previous presentations that those some some of those issues are actually relevant also for other jurisdictions. So there may be some some you know uh, issues that we, we already discussed uh, uh, today. Uh, so historical background. I try to to uh, to uh, present it with three keywords. So not to just you know not to uh, uh, give some you know years and, uh, and 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 code. So it's it's I think the uh, uh, resurrection, then twilight, and uh, at the end gradual revival. So we are still in the stage of gradual revival. And uh, so the first stage, the stage of resurrection, it's actually, uh, I, I named it that way because it's actually the resurrection of the Serbian state in the, in the modern age. So it's, uh, uh, so the first contours of the, of the development of Serbian company law goes back to the mid 19th century. So it's a period where, where, where Serbia started to liberate itself from Turkish influence, from the Ottoman Empire. And uh, from the legal point of view, it's, it's also the period when, uh, uh, when, 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 when we can see the slow growth of entrepreneurship uh, in the mid 19th century. Uh, and uh, it is the period, so from the legal point of view, when Serbia uh, adopted uh, the civil code uh, as early as 1844. It's one of the first European codifications of the time, and we in Serbia are very, very uh, proud of that. So uh, it, is what, it was based on Austrian uh, counterpart definitely uh, a lot. So some will say that we just you know, took everything from the Austrian civil code. Uh, uh, for, for company law, it's important it has uh, private property guarantees, so which was actually the the basis for uh, company law rules, which uh, which ensued a bit later, uh, and and also what is interesting uh, in this code, so there it contains uh, rules on civil partnership, which are actually applicable even today. This is a consequence of very specific legal development after the communism and during the communism. I won't go in more detail, so but it's interesting, so that those rules on civil partnership from 1844 are actually applicable even today, uh, in, in in our legal system. Uh, then in 1860 we had the commercial code, uh, and and and, and Benz had a really great presentation this morning. I won't I won't be very very uh, detailed in this. So but so it is uh, was mainly based on, on French, uh, maybe a bit in German also. Uh, so commercial code. And it's the first time we have three we had three legal forms in in 1860. And I, I also want to mention the, the specific law on joint stock companies from 1896. Uh, so the Serbian legislator in the uh, late 19th century actually recognized the need to promote this legal form in a way by having a specific law. It also contains some very modern provisions. For uh, for me, it was interesting. So we had a specific chapter on foreign joint stock companies, which actually testifies about the openness and receptiveness of the, of the Serbian legislature in the late 19th century. So there was a, a couple of provisions which were just speaking only about foreign joint stock companies operating in Serbia. So which is, I think, very it was very progressive for that time. So, but so after this progression, so uh, of course uh, uh, we, we had the first uh, first part of the 20th century. So uh, in that it, it was uh, uh, also. So, so the, the, the first Yugoslavia uh, uh, was established, and there was a lot of political turmoil, but not so many legal developments in that period. Uh, and so that's why I, I didn't skip it. So, but just we didn't have many many laws. It's it, it's it's worth to mention there was commercial code from 1937, but which has actually never applied. And then our legal scholarship usually considers this code also as a very progressive one. But again, it's not been uh, applicable uh, ever. Uh, twilight period, okay, okay, it's, it's something very common for, for all of us here, so it's the, the period of, of, of communism and we, we, there's no many, many specifics at the beginning at least for, 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 the, for, the, for the Yugoslavia, so not only so, so because we're part of communist Yugoslavia, 
There was nationalization, there was confiscation, there were different laws that were actually uh, uh, just reflected the, the ideology of the time and also the ideology changed. Uh, so we had the beginning of the concept of state property then, uh, I think it was in the 70s we came to the concept of societal property, which is something uh, uh, which uh, one of the political leaders of the time uh, nicely uh, depicted as the property which belongs to everyone and to no one. Uh, and. Um, so, so, and uh, I, I do not uh, uh, mention this concept by chance because actually this concept of societal property uh, were the basis of societal enterprises which were, I think we even have today a few, literally a few. I think in the, my hometown there is one enterprise which still did not change the status. I want to say, uh, uh, even after the changes from 2000, so we started the process of transformation, but it was a very long process and actually those kind of enterprises actually influenced our, uh, our uh, modern legal, legal developments. Uh, the gradual revival, in a way, started in 1988. So this was the the, the first uh, the first loan enterprises. So these are just like five years that I consider crucial for the development. Only this, the central one. It's not the year when we brought any law. It's the year when political changes happened. And after that, so after that, uh, uh, the process of pri privatization started. It was a very controversial process, and uh, I, I I won't speak a lot about that. So, but. It's been so uh, from the beginning of 2000, so uh, the, the country really started to change. And then uh, also we, we started to get foreign investments and we started to develop a company law in a way that, uh, that exists in other countries of Western Europe and also in other countries of Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, 2004 and 2011 are the years when we adopted our two law on commercial companies. And uh, so from that, since 2004, the development starts, you know, it starts to, 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 to be like other European countries. So since 2004, this law from 2011, we changed it several times. So sometimes because we want to, it's always the first reason to, uh, to implement some EU directives. Of course, also because of the process of digitalization sometimes. And the third reason is, of course, practical needs because the, this, this law uh, has a lot of vague or imprecise definitions and, and formulations, so that's why it has also been, uh, be be, uh, has also been changed several times. Uh, so, if we want, after this brief historical overview, to see what are the comparative roots of Serbian company law, well, I would say everything of this in a way, and it's it's really the only precise answer. Because that's a, I, I wanted to discuss it very shortly because uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a question that I, I usually get from some professors from Western Europe and they want to ask me, so what is your company law like? And I say, I, I really don't know because it's, it's not, a, uh, because it's difficult to see. Okay, we, we, we've implemented most of the EU company directives and we're still in the process of implementation. So that's of course the, the first uh, strand of, 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 of influence. But we are also very much influenced by Anglo-Saxon law, for instance, if you take a look at director's duties, and it's a very like I guess it's also in some other European countries the same, but that's the very good example of of, of the influence from the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, we have German influence, uh, uh, especially uh, as regards limited liability companies, but it's not again. Uh, I, I don't think so, uh, a colleague from Croatia mentioned so that uh, it's not in that way. So we, we just didn't take everything from from Germany. You know, we, we take something from Germany, but we also take something from other countries. So it's a kind of uh, uh, interesting. I guess from comparative view, legal experiments that we sometimes make, you know, they are sometimes successful, but uh, in most of the cases, I would say they are, they are not. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, if we come to what we have today, and uh, I, I, I picked up five issues that I want to discuss uh, briefly, uh, uh, and and and, and um, I guess uh, some other professor from Serbia or company law practitioner would uh, would choose another issue. So for me, I, I think that this is something which is general and I, I can uh, I can discuss uh, discuss some of them uh, uh, in uh, in a couple of uh, in a couple of minutes uh, so new legal forms uh, we have four legal forms a very very traditional approach uh, and we didn't uh, we haven't changed it for since 2004 since we have that first modern law and commercial company so it's it's always been so uh, general partnership, limited partnership, LLC, and joint stock companies. So uh, this issue, it's not, I think, that's current at the moment. So we had it, we discussed it. So do we need a specific vehicle for small and medium-sized enterprises? So do we need something like simplified legal forms like German, uh, a simple LLC, and uh, also Croatia has that, that, that model. So we decided not to introduce it. And at the moment, I don't think that this is still uh, an open issue. So the legal capital for the, uh, for the formation of LLC is less than one euro. So there are no uh, uh, 
certain specific reasons to have some you know, more simplified form than that. And also the process of formation of the, of the of LLC is also very simple. I, I will come to that in a couple of, 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 of minutes also. So uh, uh, we have that LLC as a legal form applicable to, 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 uh, to, 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 to everybody. But this is a, a novel development. So uh, the concept of social enterprises, it's uh, starting to get some, uh, I cannot say it importance in Serbia, but we start to talk about that. So I, I think we should, uh, we should contemplate it in a broader uh, uh, sense of the influence of uh, broader social goals and broader also sustainability goals, which definitely have, uh, have, uh, have an important role in, uh, in modern company law and modern law in general. Uh, so we recently introduced specific law on social entrepreneurship uh, and this law uh, does not introduce the fifth legal form, specific legal form, but it says any commercial company uh, and, and also some other organizational forms, but we speak about company law here. So any commercial company which adopts specific, specific goals that you have, so it has to be broader goals of course, could uh, be certified as a social entrepreneurship, so it could, uh, could do business as, for instance, LLC with the status of social entrepreneurship, which means that it can get some tax benefits or some other types of benefits or some direct, uh, direct, uh, uh, direct uh, uh, monetary help by the state. So uh, uh, we only recently adopted the program of support for social entrepreneurship. So there are no many social enterprises at the moment, so, but uh, uh, we'll see uh, whether this program could, uh, could affect it. Actually, uh, uh, there are many social enterprises who uh, adopt that principles, who, who, uh, who, who work in that way, so, but they're not legally recognized as such. They did not apply for the status. So I think this is, uh, this is interesting. So uh, uh, to finalize, we do not have a benefit corporation, but I think, you know, when I, when, when, when I, when I discuss this issue with some colleagues, so that there is maybe some intention even to perhaps think about introducing that specific fifth legal form, which would be a specific vehicle for, for the social enterprises. So that's, uh, that's one of the developments, definitely one open issue we have, uh, we have in Serbia. Uh, I think w it should be mentioned the role of public joint stock companies, because this role is actually is almost I cannot say in existence, so, but it's a very, very, uh, uh, very, very small. Uh, so, uh, of course, we do have joint stock companies, but there, as you can see from the slide, there are consequences of the mandatory legal regulation, or uh, and, and not the genuine desire of uh, of a company to choose this legal form. The reason is very straightforward. We have uh, more than underdeveloped uh, capital market. And I think it's also something which is common for, for most of the countries uh, 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 here. But uh, in Serbia, I think it's even uh, uh, maybe worse situation in some other countries. So as, as a matter of example, uh, we, uh, uh, we, we had one uh, pre-war IPO in 1940, and then the first next one was in 2018. So we had 80 years without any, uh, any initial public offering in, in, in Serbia. So. Uh, Probably uh, the situation is caused by the, because we live in a, in a bank-centric system, so banks are not willing to act as underwriters, so, and they actually uh, want companies to take loans and not to, uh, not to you know, to, not, not, not to go to, to, to the market. And, uh, and also we, we have a lack of shareholders culture and, and uh, also, uh, it's important to say, so we had some, uh, the citizens do not have uh, trust in the capital market because, and, and there are reasons for that, so we had some, some failures with collective investments in the 90s, so which are, I would say, deeply, uh, deeply abed in the, in the, in the, in the, in the feelings of most, uh, of many Serbian citizens who remember that, so there were some very unsuccessful and fraudulent collective investments, so many people are still not able and not, not, not prepared to, uh, uh, to put some money in things which are not, uh, which are not tangible, such as property, of course, real estate. And uh, it's also one of the policy issues that we have. So I think that uh, 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 also some notable Ser uh, Serbian businessmen, they're trying to, to persuade people that we should start to invest in something else other than real estate. So, and uh, for that, there is a role for, for public joint stock companies for that. So it's one of the issues of how to, how to increase their role. Digitalization is, and, uh, and, uh, is of course, uh, another, another uh, important issue also in Serbia. We had a very significant change uh, which became effective just one year ago. So from May 2023 in Serbia, the uh, online registration of companies became mandatory. And uh, this is a, a, a also an interesting development. Uh, we'll see whether the, the business register agency and the, the prospective founders of company are going to, how they're going to cope with this, uh, with this situation. Uh, I think as, 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 as some kind of provisionary conclusion, we can say that, uh, that Serbian business register agency 
is actually one of the better parts of our business environments. Uh, they are actually, I would say, I think they are ready for this. I mean, they, they need some time to adjust. So, but uh, it, it's also uh, a, a very important thing uh, in the development of our company law when this agency was established. It was 2003, I think, or four. So even before the first uh, law on commercial companies. And for these 20 years, so they really developed a good practice. And I think so. The companies in Serbia are very easily uh, established uh, and. So this, uh, this is uh, an important, uh, uh, I don't think it's going to be a big challenge, but it's definitely a novelty. Uh, I will briefly speak about this because this is another policy, uh, policy uh, uh, issue we have. So Serbia actually wants to be at the, front, at, the, at the forefront of this market for crypto assets. Uh, we adopted the law on crypto assets even before the European Union did it. So before the, the MICA regulation was adopted. Uh, and. Uh, I mean, what we basically did, we just you know, took the proposal and uh, take what we like from the proposal, but we adopted it before the European Union. Uh, and uh, so the tokenization of shares is something which you can, you can, you know, you can, you can uh, uh, hear the, you know, the talks between practicing lawyers who would say, well, it would be good if we, if we could tokenize the shares. It's not uh, uh, possible at the moment, but, uh, you know, I think it's an open issue. The conferencing people also uh, speak about it, you know, platform it. So it's, it's interesting to see. Uh, and it's, as I said, uh, if you think it is a big, is a, is a policy concern, it is because actually I, I think there is a, a desire by the state to be uh, at the front front of, of these of these innovations and and, 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 the, and these markets for crypto assets. So, uh, so that might be that might be another change, crucial change, change that that, 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 that expects our, our law. So now now going back to some more traditional issues and uh, director's duties uh, uh, are definitely uh, one of the. Uh, one of the, uh, uh, the institutions that are not uh, adequately applied in, in, in Serbia, it's actually almost not applied at all. Uh, and uh, uh, again, because this, this was actually the topic of my PhD, uh, and uh, is the situation is very similar in most of the European countries, and not only in Central East, but also in most of the Western European countries, it's also there is a problem with enforcement of directors' duties. Uh, and uh, so, so it's a good example of how one legal transplant functions uh, in the receiving country. Uh, so we have uh, a very visible lack of understanding of corporate opportunities doctrine and conflict of interest rules, which are very, very difficult for to grasp. So we have very, very specific rules. We, we actually we, we implemented the shareholder side directive too. So when we speak about conflict of interest and related party transactions, uh, but, but, but for the practicing lawyers, it's still very difficult to understand it and to apply it in, the, in different ways. So for that reason, we do not have lawsuits for breach of director's duties. So virtually not at all. Uh, when I did research for my PhD a couple of years ago, uh, at the moment we had less than five lawsuits uh, uh, for all the time. So applied, I think it was only three. Uh, the, the limits between duty of care and duty of loyalty are also not, not that uh, clear. So it's, uh, it's another another reason. Uh, this is another specific issue related to the specific situation in Serbia, that's the management of state-owned commercial companies. Uh, and uh, the question that is, of course, I, I guess, present elsewhere, uh, we uh, recently brought a specific law which regulates the, the corporate governance of state-owned commercial companies, and we'll see if it's going to make changes. So this law is, as far as I'm, uh, as far as I'm aware, was, was created along with OECD, so with the principles that they, they, they apply. So uh, at least uh, in, in the books, it should make change. So we'll see how it's, of course, in the practice, is going to be much more difficult. Uh, and uh, the last topic, but definitely not the, the least important, probably the most important one, is the creditor protection. Because if you ask, uh, a practitioner in Serbia was the problem, so they would say, okay, it's always the same. We have a company, they just, you know, close the company, you know, clean up everything, and then you cannot, you cannot, uh, uh, you, you cannot, you know, the creditors uh, stay without, without money. Uh, so what are the reasons? It's also difficult to say why, uh, because we have the, the, the peers in the corporate file, uh, and we have it actually uh, as early as 1996, so the first loan enterprises had this, this institution. And uh, it's only one provision, but I, I think it's a, it's a good actually because it's a principle-based approach. So we have a general clause which says if there is abuse of limited liability, then the shareholder who abuses the rule on limited liability is liable for the company debt. So it's uh, th there are some four examples also. So besides this general clause, so when this rule uh, uh, can apply, but in general, so it's very broad. So you can uh, uh, it, it could be applied in many. Uh, situation, but it's actually not applied. And uh, uh, for instance, in the case law, it's interesting. So the judges in Serbia for a while did uh, uh, related this institution with the criminal law concept of fraud. 
It's been criticized in our legal theories because it says, Professor Tudor's not much better, it, 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 it arises from the civil law concept of good faith. And um, uh, so that's the, uh, I think there was some more, more recent case law which started to, to change this approach. So, but for a while it was related to the concept of fraud. Um, we do not have any specific rules which deal with the problems of occurring in the vicinity of insolvency. So we do not have wrongful trading or insolvency trading rules. We do not have specific duties of directors in the vicinity of insolvency. We even do not have the duty to file for insolvency when the company is uh, actually insolvent. So uh, those are some of the comparative legal mechanisms which apply when the company is in the vicinity of insolvency. Uh, so that also might be the reason why we have a lot of so-called Phoenix companies which just, you know, uh, change the status like for sometimes even for several several times and uh, finally of course the, 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 the answer for could be the insolvency law framework uh, which is uh, which is generally okay but of course it's very slow and um, I'll just mention at the end one, one interesting thing which uh, uh, I, I want to skip that so when you speak about the Peterson the corporate wild so the legislator because it, it, because there are no lawsuits so then the legislator uh, uh, um, had another interesting solution, so it decided to uh, introduce the so-called statutory wild person, which applies whenever, whenever a company goes to compulsory dissolution. And in that case, the controlling shareholder becomes automatically, by the operation of law, liable for the debt of the, of the company. So this was also very controversial, but it applies in our law because it's, you know, it's a very important exception from the principle of limited liability and there is no need to prove the abuse. So it's just the mere fact so that the company, uh, that the company uh, uh, was deleted from the register because of the compulsory liquidation and the compulsory liquidation comes if the company usually uh, does not fulfill some of the statutory requirements to, to exist. So, so these are, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, it's 20 minutes. So yeah, so I, I, I would stop you have here. A perfect sense of <laughs> thank you. Yeah, 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 thank you. So, so that, that, that's it. So there are, of course, some many other uh, open issues, but for today, I think it's that, that, that is it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.